talk about a, an area of research that we've been involved uh, with for um, actually a little over a decade now, uh, pursuing a potential novel target in malignant brain tumors, particularly glioblastoma. Uh, and as um, Charles mentioned, this really began uh, out of our interest in looking for targets that the immune system could home in on in brain cancer as potential tumor rejection antigens. And uh, we'll talk about uh, a common virus, uh, human cytomegalovirus, um, and its potential role in uh, both glioma biology as well as the target for immunotherapy. So I do have a few disclosures, some patents related to immunotherapy, none of which are really the main focus of this talk, but I think that's a required uh, disclosure there. So um, just by way of outline, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the history uh, of human cytomegalovirus association with glioblastoma, some of the data uh, that we and others really have um, put into the field in terms of its um, association and reactivation within GBM tumors, and then talk a little bit about the potential implications of this uh, as we think about therapeutic opportunities. And so the f second part will deal with uh, pharmacologic approaches to uh, tackling CMV presence in GBM. This is not an area of work that our lab has been involved in, but uh, there have been a number of publications and some interesting studies um, that have led to this uh, work in the clinical arena, so I'll try to review that. And then uh, talk of the third part about immunotherapeutic targeting of human CMV antigens and glioblastoma, which has been an area, uh, one of the projects that our lab has uh, focused on for the past several years. And then finally, some conclusions and future directions uh, related to this. So um, cytomegalovirus is a uh, beta herpes virus. Uh, I think most people have probably heard of CMV. Uh, it is a common pathogen, one of the most common uh, in the human population. About 50% to upwards of 90% of people are infected with human CMV. Um, and so most people in this room probably have uh, evidence of prior infection of cytomegalovirus. Uh, you would not know it. In most normal individuals, they're completely asymptomatic. This virus is kept under control by the immune system and enters into a state of latency with periodic reactivation. And if you don't uh, develop any significant significant immunosuppressive diseases or undergo uh, uh, organ transplant that requires immunosuppression, uh, this usually doesn't cause any clinical problems. Um, but if you talk to anyone in the either HIV field or transplantation field, this is a pathogen that when the immune system is not efficient at controlling it can cause all kinds of uh, morbidity and mortality in immunosuppressed patient populations. Um, so how does this relate to glioblastoma? Well, we've heard a lot about this, so I won't spend much time in the background of GBM, but it's obviously a very aggressive uh, brain tumor and the most common malignant brain tumor in adults. Um, and our st standard therapies, although they are, are quite uh, extensive and aggressive, still uh, really has only extended survival uh, but to a median of 15 to 20 months from diagnosis uh, with a pretty poor five-year overall survival rate. And in 2002, uh, I was just joining the faculty at uh, Duke University and saw an intriguing uh, publication from Charles Cobbs uh, in Cancer Research, which reported uh, the frequent detection of human cytomegalovirus proteins and nucleic acids in high-grade malignant gliomas and the potential implications of a CMV infection within these tumors in terms of uh, glioma biology. Um, and there were also, uh, shortly after that, uh, a series of publications uh, from groups uh, reporting that they could not confirm the detection of CMV presence in malignant gliomas. And so I was very interested, and our group was, in looking at immune targets. And this is one of the viruses that we know the most about in terms of immunologic response. And so, uh, as Charles mentioned, we uh, gave him a call to... Uh, find out if we could learn a little bit more about the methodologies and techniques that they have been using for detecting low-level CMV and glioblastoma. And our group then published uh, the first confirmatory paper of those findings in a series of uh, glioblastoma specimens. And then listed on this uh, slide is, is a, not a complete list, but a summary of a few of the publications from now 11 uh, independent laboratories that have confirmed the detection of both CMV proteins and nucleic acids in the uh, large proportion of glioblastoma specimens. <clears throat> One of the things that's consistent across these publications is that this, the levels of viral detection are low within these tumors and required uh, special uh, adaptation of uh, detection techniques. And also the frequency of detection has been variable uh, within these publications from 50% to upwards of 90% of the tumors. And there have still been groups that have also reported that their inability to detect very low levels of CMV within these tumors. And so one of the things that I think the field can certainly benefit from, and we'll talk about a little bit, is a standardization of the techniques for detection um, and frequency so that we have a better understanding of how often uh, these uh, tumors express uh, the, these viral proteins and I'll show you some of the data from public key publications that have tried to address this.
Um, in any case, this is the uh, original paper in Cancer Research, and this is just showing one of the figures looking at immunohistochemistry uh, from uh, Charles Group at, at University of Alabama. And what you're looking at um, in the first panel there is a low magnification uh, field from glioblastoma stained for the immediate early one protein, which is one of the major immunodominant proteins from uh, CMV. And then these are higher power magnifications showing uh, nuclear staining of uh, IE1 uh, within tumor cells, but then areas of, uh, for instance, normal vasculature and other normal stroma that are devoid of staining, and then adjacent normal brain areas uh, that did not show detection of CMV proteins. And then our group published in 2008 the uh, confirmatory uh, uh, report looking at a series of 45 uh, newly diagnosed GBMs, and in greater than 90% of those samples was able to demonstrate a detection of both CMV, uh, IE1, PP65, and glycoprotein B proteins, and by a variety of techniques, including in situ hybridization, PCR detection, and immunohistochemistry. Um, <clears throat> one of the Interesting studies that tried to address more of the molecular nature of this viral infection was published by uh, Timothy Kowalik's group uh, at the University of Massachusetts. And Dr. Kowalik's a uh, molecular virologist that has studied for many, many years uh, CMV infections in the population and the, geno and the genetic diversity uh, of this viral infection and how, they, uh, how different strains are associated with spectrums of infection in uh, normal patients and immunosuppressed patients. And in this study, they looked at a series of uh, glioblastoma specimens for the viral load of uh, CMV DNA as it relates to genomic DNA. And shown here on the, all the way on the uh, far, I guess to my right, of the graph is a uh, cell line that's been infected with a viral strain of human cytomegalovirus called 8169. The dotted line shows the threshold of detection within this uh, quantitative PCR assay. And then these uh, others are a negative cell line, HEL, and then a series of primary GBM tumors that were tested for viral load. And you can see that there's quite uh, a, a high degree of variability between different uh, patient tumor specimens in terms of the level of viral DNA that's detected, um, some which approach that of uh, laboratory infections and some which approach the limits of detection. They also looked by Western blot analysis then within these positive tumors for the presence of viral proteins that span uh, the life cycle of CMV. And so this is showing Western blot detection of the immediate early one protein again in these GBM specimens, uh, PP65, which is an early to late antigen. And then in another panel, which is not shown here, they also looked at uh, a late protein, envelope protein, glycoprotein B, and showed that these proteins could be re readily detected within these primary uh, GBM samples. Interesting, when they looked at the genetic diversity of uh, amino acid sequence or genomic sequences across uh, the CMV viral strains, and this is done with uh, next-gen uh, deep sequencing um, approaches, what they were able to show is first the detection of a viral genome that spans the full length of the CMV genome. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, uh, human viruses or viruses that infect humans, and in all cases, uh, spanning the different <clears throat> segments of the viral genome, they could detect sequences, uh, implying that the cytomegalovirus uh, was intact within these tumors. And then in looking at the amino acid diversity, one of the interesting things that they noted was that the diversity of viral strains within GBM specimens appears to be different than what's seen in the uh, uh, peripheral infections in normal, uh, healthy individuals, suggesting, although not proving, that there may be uh, viral tropic strains that are more uh, prevalent within gliomas than compared to the peripheral compartments. But that would be something that would require further study to see if there's really any glioma-associated CMB strains or certain strains that have a predilection for infection uh, within these tumors. And so the implications of viral presence within these tumors does bring up the, at least the concept of whether antiviral uh, targeting of CMV may have any relevance for these tumors. And of course, uh, for, for viral targeting to be relevant, there would have to be at least some indication that the presence of the virus is not just a bystander, uh, but may in fact be contributing to um, the progression and or the maintenance of glioma tumors. And so this has been something that's continued to be an area of study, probably as a summary, but I could see the cytomegalovirus genome um, encodes for at least 200 different proteins, probably greater than that. But, um, and there are proteins that have been identified from human cytomegalovirus that actually impact on almost every 
uh, phase of the cell cycle that we know to be important for oncogenesis. I'm going to highlight a few publications that demonstrate specific proteins and their potential role in oncogenic uh, processes, but this virus certainly does encode for proteins that can modulate um, uh, tumor uh, behavior in a significant way. This was an interesting paper uh, in JCI in which these investigators took a single protein from human cytomegalovirus, US28, which actually encodes for a uh, chemokine receptor. And they, over, they uh, overexpressed this in transgenic mice uh, using a villain promoter so that this was expressed specifically within the intestinal epithelium of these animals. And just the single uh, overexpression of the US28 gene was sufficient to drive uh, colorectal cancer development within these animals. And so this is just showing um, uh, intestinal villi that overexpress US28. And at early stages uh, in these animals showed hyperplasia uh, and a more uh, elongated uh, villus, which is shown here, I'm uh, sorry, crypts uh, shown here compared to wild type animals. Uh, in addition, if they looked at uh, signs of cellular proliferation within these um, intestinal crypts, you could see using BRDU incorporation, which measures cell division, that these uh, animals overexpressing the US28 show increased cell division. And this was confirmed by looking at KI67, which is a marker for proliferative cells and showing co localization with intestinal epithelial cells that overexpress US28. And importantly, um, the overexpression of this gene was sufficient uh, to upregulate a number of different pathways implicated in cancer. And so this is looking at the RNA level of overexpression or the expression levels of uh, cyclin D1, uh, survivin, which is known to play a role in uh, anti apoptosis and tumor cell survival, the CMYK pathway, uh, as well as beta catenin. And you can see that the uh, L19, which in this case is the US28 overexpressing animals, uh, show upregulation of many of these pathways uh, at the RNA level. And there was also shown at the protein level. And if these animals were left long enough, they actually went on to develop uh, colorectal invasive can cancers. And so this uh, certainly demonstrates the possibility for uh, a single CMV gene, in this case, to actually drive uh, tumor genesis. This was a, a, another paper for, um, that was a collaboration between Lil Liliana Sorciano and Charles Cobbs that looked at the immediate early one proteins uh, in glioblastoma and their role for, uh, in the stemness properties in GBM. Um, and one of the interesting findings from this study is if you looked at the expression of the IE1 protein, uh, in this case, from uh, tumor cells, and in this case, from uh, neurospheres that are derived uh, from primary gliomas. Uh, you could see that there was a co-localization of the expression of IE1, shown in green, and other proteins that are associated with uh, stem cell markers, such as Nestin, uh, in this case, SOX2. Uh, additionally, if you performed Western blot analysis from different cellular compartments within these tumor cells, again, this is from dissociated tumor tissues, and then looking at either cytoplasmic nuclear membrane or chromatin fractions, uh, you could see immediate early one and glycoprotein B proteins from cytomegalovirus that uh, co-segregate with, for instance, nuclear proteins such as SOX2 uh, or cy cytoplasmic proteins such as GAP-DH uh, or PD, uh, PDGRF-alpha. And so there was certainly compartmental co-localization, uh, both by immunofluorescence and Western blot, to demonstrate that these uh, CMB proteins can be found in association with genes that are uh, related to uh, glioma stem cell phenotypes. And then interestingly and quite strikingly, the superinfection of GBM neurosphere cultures in vitro could lead to a market upregulation in the proliferation of these glioma neurospheres. And so what you're looking at here are two different uh, primary glioma lines that are either mock infected or actually super infected with a CMV uh, strain in vitro. And you can just see at the uh, magnification that the infection with this uh, virus drives uh, significant neurosphere formation and proliferation uh, in these uh, primary tumors, and that this could be blocked specifically with siRNAs to the immediate early one protein, but not uh, affected by control siRNAs. And then this is just shown uh, from three different uh, primary glioma uh, stem cell lines uh, that similar effects with mock versus infection of CMV in vitro showing, again, increased uh, sphere uh, formation and the ability to block uh, this formation with an IE1-specific siRNA. And so there's a number of other uh, um, uh, studies within this paper that showed uh, pathways and the expression of genes associated uh, with a cancer stem cell phenotype could be modulated uh, by IE1 uh, overexpression or HCMV superinfection and specifically blocked with siRNAs within these tumors.
And then this is an intriguing uh, publication looking more at the clinical relevance of CMV reactivation in patients with brain cancer. This study was had a little bit of a different focus. They really asked the question that uh, given there had been a reported association of CMV infection in primary gliomas as well as in some metastatic uh, brain cancers, they wanted to understand whether radiation treatment, which is routinely used uh, for these patients, may play any role in CMV reactivation. And interestingly, they showed that um, using uh, routine clinical monitoring in the peripheral blood for CMV viremia, that during radiation therapy, about a third of these patients, 30% of the patients become viremic uh, with CMV, um, and that uh, 13 out of 15 of those patients also showed uh, acute neurologic uh, symptoms consistent with encephalitis that coincided with the incidence of CMV viremia. Um, they treated uh, most of those patients uh, with antiviral treatment, gancyclovir or valgancyclovir, which are two uh, commonly used uh, antiviral drugs that have known activity against cytomegalovirus, and showed that all, um, all of these patients actually had their symptoms resolve uh, within 72 hours of treatment initiation, and that also coincided with a reversal of the CMV viremia. And so they suggested that CMV encephalitis may actually be a clinical spectrum in patients that is frequently not diagnosed or not looked for, and have continued to uh, explore studies uh, determining whether this is a, a clinical spectrum um, that we may not have previously appreciated in this patient population. So all of these studies are certainly supportive uh, of the notion that perhaps antiviral treatment, which is focused really on the uh, viral infection itself, could play a role uh, in these patients. But obviously, the, to test that requires clinical trials. Um, there is a group at, uh, Sweet <coughs> sorry, at Karolinska Institute that did do the first study looking at valgancyclovir, which is an uh, antiviral drug, uh, added as uh, add-on therapy to newly diagnosed patients with glioblastoma who received standard upfront treatment. This was done in a randomized, double-blinded uh, study where patients either received placebo treatment or valgancyclovir in addition to standard of care. Uh, when they published their initial findings from this randomized trial, it did not show a difference in the overall survival between patients that had received valcite with uh, standard treatment compared to the placebo control group. Um, they did on, on subsequent uh, analysis, a retrospective analysis of subsets of these patients, uh, there was a suggestion that patients who had been on valcite therapy for at least six months uh, compared to patients on placebo that had not progressed by six months did have uh, a survival benefit, but this was obviously uh, done in a retrospective analysis and therefore would require a, a further uh, future confirmation in a, in a prospective clinical trial. In addition, uh, Charles Cobb's group has, has uh, looked at a, a second um, antiviral drug, sidofovir. Uh, this is typically uh, a more potent inhibitor uh, of DNA replication um, and is in a somewhat broad spectrum antiviral activity and demonstrated that in both in vitro in CMV infected gliomas as well as in an in vivo uh, model of uh, xenografts that are uh, super infected with CMV or a primary xenograft that retains CMV infection uh, de novo, that the addition of sidofovir to treating these animals could uh, inhibit tumor growth as well as prolong overall survival. They also uh, were able to uncover in this study, however, that sidofovir also has activity against non-CMV infected tumor cells, which can be uh, potentiated if the virus is present, but that this uh, uh, analog may also inhibit uh, tumor replication itself, and so may have uh, a significant activity both against infected and uninfected uh, glioma tumors. So I think these are, uh, you know, also uh, potential exciting developments for a new uh, new treatment analogs to bring forward into a clinical setting, and hopefully we'll be learning more about about the uh, relevance of these antivirals as well as perhaps others uh, in treating this patient population. I'm going to switch gears uh, a little bit to talk about immunotherapy. Um, and so one of the other possibilities in thinking about tackling uh, a viral gene expression is to whether or not the immune system can be activated to essentially kill the tumor cells that are expressing uh, viral antigens. The reason we favored uh, immunotherapy as an approach is um, one, partially, that's what I did my PhD work and it was focused on. Um, but, but the other is actually the rationale that the uh, targeting by the immune system is really not somewhat agnostic to what the role of that protein actually is. Uh, if the immune system is properly activated to recognize a foreign protein, uh, its response is to try to just kill the cell that, ha that harbors that protein. And so one rationale was whether or not these viral genes were driving uh, tumor biology or just uh, happened to be present as a bystander. Uh, the immune system's response to that would still be to kill the target cell. 
Um, of course, if the virus was integral to the um, uh, gliomogenesis or the progression of tumor, then killing those tumor cells would presumably uh, um, limit the possibilities for escape or limit the possibilities that tumor cells could just shut down uh, viral gene expression and escape the immunity. But at least the basic approach was not relying on what the role of those proteins are in tumor cells. And so we, we conducted a study looking at whether or not the endogenous levels of CMV proteins that were present in primary glioma tumor cells were sufficient to serve as targets for the immune system. This is also just a Western blot analysis, in this case of a panel of GBMs that were taken from the operating room to the laboratory and tested uh, for, for uh, a number of viral proteins, similar to what had been published by the Kowalik group and confirmed that, in fact, uh, we could detect uh, PP65 IE1 and glycoprotein B uh, as proteins within these tumor cells. Our initial focus was to look at PP65 as a target simply because that was one of the most well-characterized immunologic targets and a, and a uh, large portion of the immune response in CMV-infected individuals is directed against PP65. Importantly, if we looked for um, uh, viral protein expression uh, in normal brain tissues, uh, we did not see the presence of CMV antigens expressed within the normal brain. These are from uh, autopsy specimens of patients who've died from diseases other than brain cancer. Um, and so to ask whether or not uh, CMV-specific T cells from patients with glioblastoma could be primed in vitro to recognize and kill their own tumor cells, we used an approach that had been pioneered uh, at Duke, Duke University by uh, my mentor, Ellie Gaboa, and that was, and, and Smita Nair, uh, and that is to use dendritic cells that have been transfected with RNAs encoding for the antigens of interest. And so in this assay, patients uh, dendritic cells were derived from the peripheral blood uh, and uh, electroporated with RNA encoding for PP65 and then used to stimulate uh, those patients' own peripheral blood T cells in vitro to generate a CMV PP65 specific cytotoxic T cell response. And then those T cells were tested for their recognition and capacity to kill a variety of targets in vitro. And so in the white circles, you're looking at the patient's own uh, autologous tumor cells and the capacity for PP65-specific T cells to kill those tumor cells in vitro. And then the other uh, targets are a series of controls, both uh, their own dendritic cells that have been transfected with the CMV PP65 RNA as a positive control. And then for specificity, we also use dendritic cells that are transfected with other targets, in this case, uh, RNA that's just isolated from their own PBMC, so they're essentially just expressing self-antigens, uh, or in this case, uh, dendritic cells that have been transfected with influenza virus RNA, um, and showing that those are not uh, recognized or lysed in vitro by the CMV-specific T cells. And then as a further surrogate target for tumors, we could use their own dendritic cells that have been transfected with RNA isolated from the tumor cells. And so now these DCs are essentially transiently expressing the cohort of tumor-derived antigens uh, as targets as well. And as a further control, we then generated influenza-specific T cells from those same patients, and now tested the ability for those T cells to recognize and kill influenza-expressing uh, dendritic cell targets, which they now do efficiently, uh, and in contrast, uh, do not recognize the either PP65 or tumor, uh, total tumor or total tumor RNA to pulse targets. And so in this and a variety of other assays, we're able to show that the endogenous levels of viral gene expression were sufficient, and viral protein expression were sufficient to drive immunologic recognition in vitro. And then we initiated a um, phase one study to look at the feasibility and safety of autologous dendritic cell vaccines in patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma that have been transfected with the PP65 uh, RNA antigen. This was done in collaboration with my colleague John Sampson, uh, Gary Archer is the clinical lab director, and a number of agencies that provided funding support for the preclinical IND and clinical trial. So. Um, the main objectives were to uh, look at feasibility, safety, and immunologic response. Uh, we also understood that dendritic cells, in order to work, have to migrate successfully to lymph nodes after you inject them into the skin of patients. And, and it was known from prior studies that this process of dendritic cell migration is a limiting factor. And so we studied whether we could enhance the capacity of these DC vaccines to reach lymph nodes by priming patients with either a tetanus diphtheria toxoid booster or uh, they were randomized to unpulsed uh, mature dendritic cells in a randomized and blinded clinical trial where we measured the migration of these dendritic cells to lymph nodes using uh, radio-labeled uh, dendritic cells and SPECT-CT imaging. Uh, 
and then to also evaluate the progression-free and overall survival in these vaccinated patients. So this is the clinical trial design. They were, to be eligible, they had to be newly diagnosed GBM patients who had undergone a gross total resection. These patients would have a leukapheresis to make their uh, RNA electroporated dendritic cells, then go on to receive standard of care treatment with external beam radiation and concomitant temozolomide. Um, after the first cycle of temozolomide, the patients received the first three dendritic cell vaccines biweekly, intradermally, and then they were randomized to two groups. Uh, the first group received uh, indium-labeled dendritic cells, but 24 hours before that, those patients were boosted with the standard uh, tetanus diphtheria vaccine. The other group received unpulsed dendritic cells uh, 24 hours prior to receiving their indium-labeled RNA pulse DCs. And then the migration to lymph nodes was measured by our nuclear medicine group who was blinded uh, to the treatment group where they could quantify the amount of radioactive uptake in the draining lymph nodes and back calculate then the percentage of the DC injected that had migrated to the lymph nodes. These patients then continued to receive standard of care temozolomide and monthly dendritic cell vaccines according to their uh, assigned arms. And so uh, the patients are monitored routinely uh, with imaging. Uh, we also looked at skin testing and immunologic responses. I'm going to just show some of the data. Um, but there were 13 patients that were enrolled on this study. Um, the vaccines were well tolerated in all patients. We were able to successfully make vaccines from all these patients. And we were able to demonstrate that PP65 specific immune responses were increased uh, in patients that were vaccinated. Interestingly, the migration of the dendritic cells to their lymph nodes actually correlated very strongly with progression-free survival and overall survival in this study. And in fact, the patients that had been randomized to the tetanus diphtheria toxoid group showed a, a markedly enhanced DC migration and also a markedly prolonged survival compared to the other group. Um, this study was published uh, now almost uh, two years ago. Um, and this is just showing how these uh, migration studies work where the indium labeled cells at time zero can be seen in the upper thigh regions where the uh, patients are injected. Uh, the migration that we're looking for is to the inguinal draining lymph nodes. And so the region of interest around here shows that 48 hours, you can see only a small fraction of the actual radioactive uptake is present in the lymph nodes. And then uh, using the SPECT CT imaging and, and counting, the uh, nuclear medicine group can calculate the percentage of lymph node uptake at 24 hours and 48 hours after injection. And when these patients were unblinded, we could see that the patients that have received this tetanus diphtheria toxoid booster uh, showed an increased uh, lymph node uptake uh, at both time points. Um, and this was correlated with their progression-free survival and overall survival across the whole group. And importantly, when you looked at the randomized groups, the group that had received the tetanus diphtheria toxoid booster uh, showed a significant increased progression-free survival and overall survival compared to the other randomized arm. Now, because this was not the set up to detect a clinically significant benefit, it certainly wasn't powered uh, for that. Uh, this would have to be reconfirmed in a prospective trial with survival as an endpoint. Um, but we thought that this was quite a striking uh, observation, and in st further studies had uh, shown in the mechanism of how this is operative uh, in an animal model. Subsequent to that, um, we also uh, were looking at studies uh, exploring the effects of temozolomide on immune responses. Uh, this is a prior study we had published showing that, um, and others have mentioned this earlier, that if you actually vaccinate during the recovery from temozolomide because of that lymphopenia and the body's trying to regenerate an immunologic response or trying to regenerate normal cell counts, those T cells that have been boosted by a vaccine actually can outcompete uh, non-boosted T cells and expand to much greater extent. And so this is showing in an animal model uh, a dose-dependent increase in T cell expansion when we vaccinate animals specifically with dendritic cells uh, targeting a model antigen and then follow the expansion of those T cells um, in the peripheral blood. And so uh, we were interested in understanding how dose-intensified temozolomide regimens might impact on immune responses. Uh, at the time, uh, there was an ongoing phase three clinical trial that was comparing standard dose temozolomide to dose-intensified temozolomide in patients with glioblastoma. The expectations and the hope at the time that that trial started was that dose-intensified temozolomide was going to be more effective, essentially by giving smaller doses of temozolomide over a longer period of time. Um, and we therefore wanted to perform a study to understand how immune responses might be impacted by dose-intensified temozolomide. As it turned out, that phase three trial did complete and showed that dose-intensified temozolomide had no benefit in, uh, alone in its outcomes for patients with glioblastoma. Uh, but we have had some interesting findings in terms of its potential impact on immunotherapy. So again, this was a single-arm study, so you have to 
take that um, uh, as a caveat. But the patients uh, that were treated now with the same dendritic cell vaccine formulation, uh, this time we had actually, uh, uh, since the completion of the first trial, had added GMCSF as an adjuvant to the DC vaccines. And these are patients that receive the same schedule, but now a more dose-intensified regimen of temozolomide. And these patients showed markedly uh, enhanced immunologic responses um, and also uh, a quite significant uh, prolonged uh, overall survival, which the median still has not been reached uh, uh, with greater than 40 months. And so we're quite excited that this um, uh, population of patients may benefit from this combination. These are just uh, control uh, uh, curves based on the prognostic criteria for the patients that were enrolled on this trial. There are different nomograms that can be used to predict expected patient survival, including their uh, extent of resection, their performance status, their MGMT status. And regardless of whatever predictors we would use for this patient cohort or our historical controls, these patients have certainly farly, far exceeded expected outcomes. And so we now have initiated a, a randomized um, prospective blinded placebo-controlled trial to try to confirm the clinical and immunologic uh, efficacy of this treatment approach. And so this trial just opened a couple of months ago at our center and is actively enrolling. Um, but patients with newly diagnosed GBM are eligible. They must have undergone, uh, be eligible for surgical resection or have undergone surgical resection. And we have to enroll them prior to starting radiation therapy so that we can capture cells uh, for the leukapheresis. But then they are randomized into one of three arms, all of which would receive, in this case, uh, dose-intensified adjuvant temozolomide and either uh, two different vaccine formulations or autologous unpulsed PBMCs. And so this trial has a survival as a primary endpoint and will uh, a target of enrolling 120 valuable subjects. And hopefully uh, it will take a couple of years in order to get the data from this trial, but we hope to be able to confirm what we think looks like early uh, promising early phase data. So conclusion of, um, is we do believe CMV proteins are expressed within the majority of malignant gliomas, and this has been confirmed by a number of laboratories, uh, but standardization of techniques for detecting low-level CMV infection would certainly accelerate the pace of research in this field. Um, there are proteins within this virus that have oncomodulatory properties and studies that would support um, the possibility that they can play a role in glioma progression as well as uh, the phenotype of these tumors. And antiviral pharmacologic treatments certainly warrants further exploration, perhaps in selected subgroups of patients, as well as CMV-directed immunotherapy, we think shows significant promise in early phase studies and warrants exploration in larger and randomized clinical studies.